and um, okay, Shen Wan. Um, okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. So um, today I'm gonna um, talk about something that I call a birational Kleinian group. And let me begin with uh, the classical notion of geometry structure introduced by A. Hirschman. So um, the ge a geometric structure on a manifold is just uh, a way to patch the coordinates. So uh, the usual definition of a manifold is you, you have a bunch of local charts and then you glue them together with uh, some different morphism. And now you want to add some conditions on these changes of coordinates. So uh, we need uh, at first a model space, which is a manifold X with uh, action, a faithful action of a Lie group on it. And then I say that uh, geometric structure on the manifold modeled on X is just uh, netless such that the local charts are open subsets of the model space X and the changes of coordinates are uh, restrictions of transformations in the Lie group G. Okay, this is a, a classical notion of geometric structure. Now I uh, want to modify it by allowing different kinds of uh, model space. So here the model space is a manifold with a Lie group action. Uh, what I want is something more algebraic. So uh, before uh, Introducing the new definition, let me just uh, explain briefly what is a birational map. So uh, birational maps are between uh, algebra varieties. And instead of giving you a precise definition, I'm just gonna explain it with the projected space. A birational map from the complex projected space to itself is just a map that can be written in homogeneous coordinates uh, in the following way. So the PI you see here are homogeneous polynomials uh, with the same degree. And uh, such map is birational if it has an inverse which has uh, the same form. Uh, for example, in, in dimension two, if you take the project space of dimension two, the following map is a birational map because you see the uh, homogeneous polynomials here are of degree two, and uh, the inverse of its, this map is just itself. So you can compose this map with itself and you're gonna have the identity. Okay, so uh, you may wonder, uh, uh, actually the, the, the map defined uh, as this is not uh, really a map from P2 to P2 because the polynomials PI may have common zeros and the map is not well defined uh, on these zeros. So uh, birational maps are not are actually not uh, global diffeomorphism. They have some bad points and the group of birational transformations of a variety is usually not a Lie group and its action on that variety is not really a set theoretic group action because of the, the bad points. And that's why the definition that, that I'm going to state is a modification of the classical notion of geometry structure. So um, here I'm going to mimic the definition of classical geometry structure by replacing the model, model space by a projective variety and the group action by uh, the group action of its group of birational transformations. And uh, there's some subtle point here I'm gonna just skip. So the open subsets, the local charts can be uh, open subsets of different varieties, but uh, birational to each other. Okay, so th this is uh, what I call a birational structure. And today I'm gonna focus on the simplest situation where uh, birational structure can call. So uh, the simplest situation is, that, is as follows. You take a projective Y, uh, a smooth projective Y, and you take an open subset of Y uh, called U, uh, open subset in the usual topology, not in the Zariski topology. 
and I take a group of variational transformation such that um, the transformation in this group are well defined on the open set U. They do not have bad points in U. And I ask that the quotient of the domain U by the action of gamma is a compact complex manifold. And I call the data of such four objects a variational Kanyan group. Uh, you can uh, play with the definition by uh, allowing not just compact, but uh, maybe a quasi-projective um, quotient as well. But, um, I, I'm just uh, do the compact definitions already quite complicated. Okay, so uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, the most trivial example is uh, the example of compact story. You take uh, Y to be the projective space of dimension n and the, the open set u, you just take the affine space, which is a Zariski open set. And the group gamma is isomorphic to z to the 2n. And it's a group of translations acting on the affine space. And the quotient um, is a complex torus. And you have also the examples given by both quotients. Uh, the space is still Pn, and the open subset is a Euclidean ball uh, inside Pn, and the group of automorphism of the ball is the Lie group Pu1n, uh, which is a subgroup of the group of automorphism of projective space. And in this case, if you take some lattice of Pu1n, then the quotient, uh, you get a projective variety. Okay, and uh, this um, bow coaching case is just a particular example of a series, uh, a family of examples given by uh, Hermitian symmetric spaces. So every bounded symmetric domain can be embedded in the project variety and the group of automorphism of that bounded symmetric domain um, is a subgroup of the group of automorphism of the ambient projective variety. So uh, every bounded symmetric domain uh, will give you some uh, birational Kanyan groups. Okay, so uh, let's come back to the definition. So there are many objects in this definition. Uh, there are this domain U, which is uh, infinite Galois cover of the quotient manifold X. So in the simplest case, uh, let's assume that U is just uh, simply connected and uh, then the, the, the domain U is just the universal covering of X, right, of the quotient manifold. So the study of variation Kanyan group is uh, closely related to uh, uniformization of complex manifold. So uniformization of Riemann surfaces are uh, classical, but in higher dimension, uh, the universal coverings of compact, compact compass manifolds are extremely complicated. Even for projective varieties, uh, their universal covers are uh, very complicated. So um, to be able to say something about the universal covers of projective varieties, uh, one can make some additional algebraic conditions. Uh, for example, um, with some additional uh, technical assumptions, there are some results that say uh, if the un uh, universal cover of a projected manifold is algebraic or semi-algebraic, then uh, the variety is uh, necessarily a Nebelian variety or a symmetric variety. Uh, so these two results that I state here are only proved under very strong additional assumptions. But uh, still, they suggest that uh, a direct algebraic assumption on the universal cover itself is uh, probably too strong to get anything interesting. Okay, so from this point of view, this point of view of uniformization, the study of variational Kleinian groups is a problem of uniformization with models. So uh, what do I mean by models? I mean, uh, not only we put 
the universal cover uh, in the algebraic variety, but uh, we ask that the action of the deck transformations uh, to extend to, uh, to, to be algebraic actions, okay. Um, let's look at the situation in dimension one. In dimension one, uh, as we all know, the classical uniformization theorem says that every hyperbolic Riemann surface can be uniformized by the unit disk, which is a, a open subset of the complex projective line and the uh, deck transformation group can be a subgroup of PSL2R, which is a subgroup of the automorphism group of the projective line. And this is not the only possible uniformization. In dimension one, we can have other models by, uh, for example, deforming uh, the group gamma in PGL2C. So if we deform the group gamma in PGL2C, uh, we can get different domains with different dynamics while keeping the quotient Riemann surface isomorphic. So uh, if we deform gamma a little bit, we get a quasi-fusion group. Uh, the domain that it preserves is no longer the unit disk, but a topological disk with a complicated boundary. And the action of this group on the complex projective line is not conjugate to uh, the action of a uh, fusion group. Okay, so um, the, the quotient Riemann surface can be the same, but uh, the model for the uniformization are different. So what happens in higher dimension? So today I'm just going to state results for uh, dimension two. So in dimension two, uh, one special case of variational Kleinian group is already known 20 years ago. Uh, if we assume that the surface is just the P2 and the group is uh, not really variational, but just a group of automorphism of the projected space of dimension two, and we assume that U is simply connected and the quotient is scalar, then the only examples are complex Tori and the Bohr quotient sets I have shown you before. Okay, and uh, um, the result of my thesis is the following classification in dimension two. Uh, so I still assume that U is simply connected and the quotient manifold X is scalar, but I assume no more uh, that Y is a project ply and I assume no more that the group is an automorphism group. Uh, the classification is as follows. There are uh, seven cases, possible cases. The first case is just a case of compass tori. The second case is a bow quotient case. And the third case is the uh, case of bi disk. So there are two bounded symmetric domains in dimension two, one is the bow and the second is the bi disk, the product of two uh, unit disk. Uh, so the, the third case is this case of bi disk and the group is a lattice in the product of two copies of PSO2R. And the fourth case is the stupid case of product of two uh, one dimensional classical Kleinian groups. Okay, and the fifth case, the domain is a product domain. It's a product of D1 with uh, C, uh, where D1 is a component for some one-dimensional Kleinian group. Okay, and in the sixth case, uh, the domain is also a product where the first factor is a component for some one-dimensional Kleinian group. And the uh, fifth and the sixth case, it's uh, like a twisted product, okay. So, 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 so the quotients are some fabrications, actually fiber bundles. And there are this, uh, there, there is this seventh case and the, the classification theorem is uh, in, incomplete in the sense that uh, this seventh case is a little bit mysterious. Uh, I'm not gonna explain in details what uh, the seventh case is, 
uh, but I just want to say that the case of bar disk, the third case, is actually a special case of case seven. But we do not know whether uh, the seventh case is reduced uh, to the third case. Right. Uh, we don't have uh, an example of case seven, which is not case three, and I don't, I, I, I'm not able to prove that case seven is reduced to case three either. Okay, uh, but under some additional uh, hypothesis, uh, I can prove that the case seven is reduced to case three. So, um, uh, for example, uh, let's come back to the situation of dimension one. So in dimension one, you can deform the unit disk, the case of fusion groups. If you deform it, uh, you get a domain, which is still uh, uh, conformal to, to the disk, but the boundary is uh, uh, kind of wide. But uh, the boundary in, in this case, in, in the case of dimension one, it's still a Jordan curve. So it's not that wild. So what I can prove in dimension two is uh, even if uh, case three can be deformed to obtain some exotic examples of case seven, even if we can deform case three uh, after deformation, uh, the domain uh, cannot uh, have uh, a nice boundary as a Jordan curve. It cannot be uh, of Lebesgue measure zero while being locally connected. So uh, in, some, some, in some sense, in dimension two, there, there's no quasi-fusion uh, quasi deformations of by disk uh, situation. So um, to finish the talk, instead of uh, exp explaining in two words of the, the proof of the classification theorem, I'd rather uh, talk about uh, more about the, the last case. So it, it's not obvious, but uh, the question whether uh, case seven is reduced to case three uh, is actually, uh, can, can be actually uh, interpreted to uh, other things, it's, it's related to other mathematics. So uh, the question whether this case is reduced to case three can be interpreted as an analog of uh, existence of Teichmuller curves in uh, Teichmuller spaces of infinite dimension. So um, uh, roughly speaking, the Teichmuller curves, it's a um, uh, holomorphic geodesic disk in Teichmuller spaces uh, with a large group action on, on it. So um, if there are such touch mirror curves in touch mirror, uh, if, there, there, if there aren't such curves in uh, touch mirror spaces in infinite dimensions, then uh, case seven is reduced to case three. And th this question is also related uh, to uh, a problem of sub varieties of some uh, super rare varieties uh, by uh, some deep theorems of Gwyneth Simpson from non-Belian Hart theory. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. <laughs>